thanks for coming out on a dreary day. And um, I love the standbys because they, uh, they're optimists, aren't they? <laughs> like me. Um, and I'm, I'm all about optimism these days. And everybody's so full of gloom and doom. But I see great opportunities everywhere. So um, Deborah did a great pitch for the ASMP. I don't really need to add to that. Um, other than to say that uh, primarily we are still a photography or organization. However, with the convergence of the tools and um, print moving to electronic delivery, a lot of our members have also segued into video. Uh, I do not call myself a videographer. Um, I hate that word. Uh, it conjures up like cheap 70s soap operas or something to me. I just I'd rather call myself a filmmaker um, because I make short films. I also do video production for corporate work, but um, don't ever call me that or a Jersey girl, even though I live in Jersey. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can get my iPad to work. There we go. So uh, my name is Gail Mooney, and I've been a photographer, still photographer, for over 35 years. Um, started getting into video about 15 years ago when uh, digital video hit the scene and I was able to actually create my own films, short films. So anyway, um, I, I spent uh, a, a good portion of my uh, still photography life um, working for magazines like the National Geographic, Traveler Magazine, Travel and Leisure, Smithsonian, and um, did some corporate work for my bread and butter. So when I segued uh, or started learning about motion, I realized that um, so many of the stories, and I'm a storyteller, that were inside of me um, really were dependent on sound and movement. And so nowadays I have a foot <coughs> in both worlds. I have not abandoned one for the other. We're a multimedia world. That's the way we communicate. So I'm here today to talk about a project that I did um, in the summer of 2010. My daughter and I, we decided to circle the globe and make a, a documentary, a feature documentary about people who were making a positive difference in the world. It was inspired by um, a friend of my daughter's who she went to high school with. And this young woman, instead of going off to college like a lot of kids were, she decided to take a gap year. She traveled and she wound up in Nepal at the age of 19. She wired home for her babysitting earnings and she um, ended up building a home for herself and 30 orphan children. Nepal had just gone through 10 years of civil war, and there were tens of thousands of orth orphans. So um, that's where she felt the calling. When we caught up with her, uh, I guess four years later, um, she was 23, and she had just finished building a school for 250 kids. And now she's building high school. She's 26 years old. So that was the impetus of this journey. Uh, that my daughter and I went on and spent the, the it, it's a process, um, a process I did not know because I'd never made a feature length film before and uh, started getting it into film festivals and did, have done that for about a year and I'm kind of done that but, but did that to build my creds up in hopes to find distribution. But what I'm finding is there's a huge um, market, an aftermarket for this documentary in schools and community grass screenings, because it's a call to action. And that was our hope initially, to, to inspire and motivate people to take action in their own communities. <coughs> you don't have to go clear across the world to do it. Um, and it's happening. So without further ado, we'll, well, uh, j just to give you an idea, uh, a couple weeks ago, I sent out a, a mailing to 200 um, high schools that were located between, let's say, Vermont and Washington, D.C., so that if they wanted me to also come and speak and show the film, I could do it in a drive there and back. Out of 200 schools, I had a 17% response rate. And I don't know if you know about like response rates, rates for most promotions, but that's phenomenal, I'm told. Out of that 17%, probably more than half booked a screening. So that was kind of my test case, you know, and I'd like to broaden it from there. And they all want to do workshops with it. They don't want to just show the film and let people leave the theater 
and be done with it. So, anyway, here's a trailer. I felt can, there had to be a reason sorry. that I've been put on this earth. First day was actually really intense and I want to say a little bit scary. I had no idea at the beginning what the heck I was doing. I must have been absolutely insane to go and do that. And it's not perfect. If I had waited for things to be perfect, it never would have happened. I remember what service used to look like. I remember what communities used to look like. I'd never seen poverty like that. They have nowhere to sleep because the wood is so full. I was really struck by what I saw. It felt like a triage unit of a war hospital. They have never seen a doctor, sometime in their whole life. There were a lot of patients, and here was a doctor without medicines. In the beginning, I really did think, I'm going to go home, I'm going to work a little bit, send some money back and build a small home for a couple of kids. We just started forming this family, and the 20th kid came, and then the 25th, and we're up to 30 now. I felt there had to be a reason that I've been put on this earth. What I've tried to create is just something positive, one little piece of something that's positive and good and happy. So much good can come out of us just getting our hands dirty and trying to create change. Anything that you want to create, you can do. The universe will just conspire in your favor. You may have all these riches and you are not happy. I have nothing, no nothing. I have peace. Find that in yourself, what you want to do with your life, what makes you happy. There's a way to connect to good stuff all the time. We just have to shine each other up. I come in every day and I think, today could be the day for someone. Someone whose life has been absolutely filled with pain and suffering. It might be today. The light dawns and the window of opportunity opens and I want to be there when that happens. Your life will change. Mark II. Um, the reason I opted for that camera is we were living out of two backpacks and I wanted to shoot both stills and video. I could not bring two camera systems. That is why I opted for it. Um, I did not opt for it because it was a beautiful image. However, I've seen it, that film play in big giant screens and cineplexes and it's unbelievable. But that was not why I chose that as my solution. So I always tell people, pick the right camera for the right job. In this case, we needed to save space. It was a pain in the neck in other regards, but it got the job done, okay? So everybody likes to know the numbers, the statistics. I'll run through them really quickly because I don't remember them. <laughs> uh, 99 days, that was production. That was on the road, the shoot. Didn't count the post-production. <laughs> Um, six continents, 17 countries, 30 flights, 11 subjects, although we cut it down to nine for the hour cut, 14 vaccinations, eight visas, 2,900 gigabytes of content, which is 150 hours of footage, and 5,000 still images. <laughs> so. That's it. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Um, so the first thing I tell people to do, everybody has ideas, right? How many people really act on them? And I know I'm guilty of the same. I have ideas every day. And some of them are great ideas, and I just don't act on them for one reason or another. So I find that when I tell somebody, you know, i got to save face because that's important to me. So if we, I really want my idea to, to happen and take off, I'll tell somebody. And then I'll tell someone else. And then I'll like blast it to the universe on my blog.
and then I have to do it. <laughs> so um, this kind of started out like that, you know. I, um, I'd gone to see Robert Frank's uh, Americans exhibit in the Met, and I had been a traveler my whole life. When I, I had left college after two years, I was studying architecture, and I decided to hitchhike around the world when I was 19. You know, this is like 1971. And um, after doing that, I've spent a life traveling and working. My work is my pleasure. And I was feeling like, wow, I really needed a road trip. And I saw this exhibit, and it was all about his road trip in the 50s. And like, wow, I really, really want to go on the road. This is 2009. And I said, but I don't want to just travel for the sake of travel. I want a purpose. <coughs> And that's when I was inspired by Maggie. And so I got back from that, um, that exhibit, and I, and I thought, well, all right, I'm going to proclaim it to the world. And I did. So the first thing I did was I sent out an email to everybody I knew looking for subjects on six continents. And I got stacks and stacks. I used to say binders, I say folders now, I don't use that word anymore, um, <laughs> of people, of ideas. And, but the first person who answered my email, I was going to do this by myself, the first person who responded was my daughter. She had graduated from college in 2008. She was lucky she got a job. She had been working for a year. Uh, and she, you know, she had a nice life. She decided to stay in Chicago. We live in New Jersey. And she wrote to me saying, Mom, I want to do this with you. You told me to follow my passions when I'm young. You told me to travel when I'm young. And I'm like, oh my God, she listened to me all those years. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> while she was listening to me, you know, I was listening to myself, the real self inside that was telling me I had to do this. And you know, there's opportunities today because you got these cameras that cost far less than $5,000 that enable an idea like this. So I knew I had 360,000 airline miles. I probably had the same amount in American Express points and hotel rewards. I knew. I was at an age, I didn't know if I could be doing this much longer, but I could do it now. And it was like the perfect storm, you know? It was like the right time in my life to do this. And so I started to make it happen. So for anybody thinking of doing this, um, I tell everybody the most important thing of all is the idea and the story. I don't care if you're making a narrative film or if it's a documentary. The story is the most important thing. Way more important than the gear and all the stuff that you put in your bag. If you don't have a good story, you got nothing, OK? So you need a good story, a good character, and access. The story is everything. A good story usually has conflict, and many good stories are all about transformation, you know? And this was certainly a documentary about transformation, not just all the people that we met and how they were transforming other people's lives, but how it had transformed their lives and how it had transformed our lives by working on this film. And people are drawn to a good character. I centered the film when it came down time to, to edit the film, and I was working with an editor, but before I handed it off to them, I needed to have a very clear idea. What am I going to do with 2,900 gig gigabytes of film? And I decided to center it, not bounce all over between 11 people, because everybody would tick down, OK, here's Uganda, you know, Argentina, and I didn't want that to happen. So I took Maggie, since she was the inspiration, and I just kept coming back and forth between her story, and it worked, because she was my central character. So even if you have an ensemble piece, you really need an anchor of some sort. And for me, Maggie was the anchor. It just made perfect sense. And I read the book, um, Save the Cat, by Blake Snyder. 
I highly recommend it. Easy read. It's about screenwriting. And even if you're not writing a screenplay, like for narrative, it helped me a lot. These light bulbs went off. Because I didn't go to film school. I went to photography school. So this was not, not natural for me. Save the Cat, Blake Snyder, B-L-A-K-E. Snyder is S-N-Y-D-E-R. And Access. You know, all those years <laughs> working for the Geographic. Gosh, talk about Access. You got great Access, right? Um, here I had great Access, even though it was my own commission, if you will. Um, I was many times staying with my subjects. <coughs> we were in remote places. There was no hotels for me to, to you know, so I was always on, because I was right there with them. Okay, so make a budget. Start with a plan. You know, you, you got to consider your gear, your crew, or your talent. Locations, sets, props, travel. In my case, I funded almost all my travel with my airline points, my hotel rewards, I cashed in, stayed with people. Uh, traded a uh, web video in a, uh, in a property, a hotel in uh, Sydney, Australia, where it was very expensive. It would have cost me probably three grand because we were there two weeks. Did a web video for them. And then I used the B-roll in my film. <laughs> they wanted me to shoot breakfast stuff. And I had a, a story about a food rescuer. So it came in handy, you know, multi-purposed it. Uh, Post-production. Everybody runs out of money for the post-production. And wow, that's where the story comes together. So plan well. And don't forget about the marketing promotion. And I'll throw fil film festivals in that with it. When it comes time to the marketing promotion and getting around to these film festivals, you need some money for that. Or nobody's going to see your movie. And why did you make it? So plan. So funding. So there's different ways everybody in this room can get funding. You can certainly hit up your family and friends. Um, but you know, you want to stay friends. And you, wanna st you want your family still to speak to you, so hopefully your movies will be a success. <laughs> Don't overpromise and underdeliver. You can certainly take on partners. Um, but remember, they're going to probably want a stake in it, meaning a creative stake. Most people don't hand you money. They, want, they might want to be part of it. They might want to even direct it, you know? So that comes with the territory. Um, investors, like viable, you know, selling shares. But then you cross into a territory, you know, legal territory, that the SEC um, becomes involved in. So read up on it. I did not go that route. That's certainly a route. If you're trying to finance something for $2 million or something. Um, and there's, you can always find seminars like this. At most film festivals, they have panels and people talk about stuff like this. So you can learn that way. And studios, if you should be so lucky and Warner, Brother, Warner Brothers comes to you and say they want a, you to direct their film for, you, for them, that's fine. But you know the trade-off is they own it. You don't. Okay? They make the lion's share of the money. You don't. That's certainly, I wouldn't turn it down, believe me, but that is a trade-off. And um, you can apply for grants. You can, um, you know, like I'm affiliated with uh, the San Francisco Film Society so that I can get funds through them because they're a 501c3. A lot of people won't give money to an individual. They want the tax write-off. So try to get an affiliation with them, especially if you're going for grants. There's very few that they give to individuals. And the route that I did twice, crowdfunding. I did a Kickstarter campaign, and I did an Indiegogo campaign. And they were, they were both fairly successful. I'll talk about them a little more. And by the way, if anybody has any questions, um, save them, because um, I, I probably answer them. <coughs> and um, I've got a lot to go over, and I don't want to not, not so just like write it down if you have one and we'll get to it. So pre-production, getting ready. And this, this was a huge thing to get ready. I mean, I wasn't just getting ready to do a, um, a, an assignment. You know, I was getting ready to take a major trip with all the travel logistics. That in itself was a huge job. But the first thing 
ironically, I did is I set up our blog, Opening Our Eyes, openingourice.net. It doesn't look like this anymore. We've changed it, and we're actually doing, doing another change right now because we're taking it away from just a film to take action, making it more interactive. But what we didn't realize at the time was that in writing this blog, we were creating an audience. We were doing the most important thing of all. We were just blogging. We weren't thinking about creating an audience, to be honest. <laughs> you know, but if I did it again, I'd be thinking about it. But this was just kind of a lucky thing, you know? It just seemed natural. Everybody said, yo, wow, tell me about your travels. So we wrote about them. Um, here's our crew. Well, <laughs> that's when, that was where we, we were in uh, Peru, in, uh, along the Amazon River in the jungles. And they were planting, believe it or not, in the jungles, these little hardwood seedlings. Because um, those trees in that environment in 10 years time will be big enough to build a house with, you know, their house, their idea of a house. Um, and so an odd notion, but that's what one woman was doing down there, kind of reforestation in the jungle, if you will. But they were hardwood trees, you know, they weren't weeds. So that was our crew. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages to a small crew. Certainly the advantage is we can travel pretty quickly, be flexible, because there's only two of us, right? Um, we didn't look like a TV crew. We didn't want to look like a TV crew. Shoot me if I ever wear a photo vest. I never wanted ever to look like a photographer. I want to blend in. I want people to get used to me and not, not notice me at all. I want to become part of the scenery. And, um, and I sure don't want to look like a TV crew, crew coming through customs. That's like, no. <laughs> in fact, I'll tell you a story about visas um, with that in mind. The disadvantage, of course, is you do a lot more work. You know, you've only got two people to spread the work on, so you do a lot more work. Travel logistics. I don't know if anybody can see this, but that was our, that was our kind of major round the world ticket. And then we did another one. We actually had to come back to North America and do another ticket down to South America because once you come back to where you started from, your round the world is done. So that cost, maybe you can see it, $263.44. <laughs> <laughs> and 160,000 miles. But that's not a bad de deal. Think about it, 160,000 miles? I could have gone to a lot more places than that. And I did. We, need to t we did need to ticket some, some inner flights, like um, Continental. Uh, it was Continental at the time. They didn't go to Kathmandu. So I needed to ticket something from uh, Delhi to Kathmandu, things like that. Flew into Bangkok, but my subject was in Chiang Rai. So I needed to ticket that, stuff like that. But that was the small stuff compared to this. So that was a screaming deal. Um, you need to allow time for your visas. Uh, minimum turnarounds overnight, but you don't want to throw money at the problem. And I hate to tell people to lie, but um, don't put photojournalists on a visa application because you won't get it. <laughs> you won't get a multiple entry visa. And that's what happened to me. Um, one of the first visas I went to was India. And I had to have a multiple entry. It's like I just said. I was flying from Delhi to Kathmandu. Well, to pick up my next leg, I had to get back to Delhi. They wouldn't give it to me because I put a photojournalist visa on. So I put on my best actress routine. And I said, oh, my daughter, this is her present to me. I'm retiring. You know, and This is her present this around the world. It's going like, to mess the whole thing up. And, this woman took me under her wing and changed it to a tourist visa, and I got my thing. But um, live and learn. I never did it again. I put um, artist. That's an, kind of innocuous. <laughs> um, teacher. Retired. I can do that now. <laughs> I can get away with that now. Um, so yeah. But you know, there's, there's no glory uh, other than your ego. <laughs> Okay, of looking like a big shot TV person with a lot of gear. Believe me, doesn't work for me. <laughs> All right, so, um, and, and you gotta leave time for the unexpected. 
There, there's my gear. Everybody said, and see that? There is a vest there, it's a Scotty vest. Have you ever heard of Scotty vests? They're like real flat pockets. Oh my God. When, when they wouldn't let us on the small airplanes, you know, with our <coughs> camera bags, we'd stuff that thing, we'd be like, we'd look like terrorists, you know, getting on that plane. You know, but the, the idea is it's supposed to look flat and not be all bulgy. Well, we had a laptop in the back, in the back pocket. I mean, it was crazy. Um, and we'd take it off to put it on the, the, the x-ray belt and we'd go, boom, you know, 40 pound vest. But it worked, you know, it worked in those situations. Um, and it all fit in two backpacks, except the tripod. The tripod was small enough, it, it fit into, we each had um, two roller bags, small ones, but it fit in there. Okay, so a little bit more about gear. Um, I had to have a backup camera. In my, in my um, case, I brought a 7D. You know, it was cheaper than a 5D, and it did the trick. Now, my daughter is not a photographer. She graduated college. She's an anthropologist. However, she spent a lifetime um, hanging out when me and her father, who's also a photographer, would do shoots, and she would watch. And I didn't know. Like I said, she did, wasn't listening. And, you know, your kids are listening, and they're watching, too. So her, her little point-and-shoot broke midway through the trip. And I said, here's the 7D. Put it on automatic settings for her. I said, OK, now you're doing all the stills. And she did really good. And she had a great eye. And I said, wow, I didn't even know you were shooting those pictures. Or, wow, great eye. And she goes, well, mom, I've been watching you my whole life. I've been watching and seeing what you do, what you wait for, what you shoot, what you don't shoot. She just was soaking it all up. So, but I would keep, um, you know, I used a Zacuto rig when I was doing my B-roll. And that thing's kind of a pain to get on and off, you know, with the, with the uh, eyepiece. So I just kept that rigging on the camera. And then I took it off the 7D and I kind of dedicated that, a still camera. But if need be, that was my backup for video. Because there was no, you know, uh, repair shops where I was going. Well, we couldn't even buy decent batteries, let alone that. Uh, the other thing is we brought another backup laptop. We were all digital workflow. So we were in big trouble if our laptop um, failed. And I was also with my daughter. And when we could get online, I didn't want a big argument. You know, you've been online 20 minutes. It's my turn. You know, so that was nice, too. Um, plus, we were both blogging. Uh, batteries, believe it or not, we were in many, many, many situations where we did not have electricity. First of all, constantly needed batteries for, um, I used the H4N Zoom. That was a battery hog. Um, my LAV, you know, my wireless transmitter kit, batteries. My, my 5D, well, that was um, rechargeables. You know, so I always kept them charged. My, um, what else ran on batteries? Um, my Juice Link batteries, nine volts, I think. And that was sucking them up too. So I had a ton of batteries. Somewhere in the flight, they, they took them from me. They wouldn't let me on the airplane. They wouldn't let me check it in. So they, they took my batteries and um, I had to get new ones. And luckily it was toward the, tail end of the first trip, because almost every single battery I bought was from some hot, hot, dusty little shop somewhere. And they were, they were dead. They were old. They were like no good. You know, they'd been sitting there for God knows how long. So luckily we had gone to Australia and I was able to, you know, but wow, what a lifesaver. Plenty of hard drive space. Uh, again, um, I, was no, I was not near any FedEx offices to dump and send hard drives back. So I knew I'd be gone for a good long time. And I had eight, I think there were eight Lossy 500s at the time, you know, and I just made it because I would do double backups and just made it before we went to South America because we had four, four days when we came back and when we left. That was just enough time for me to send my cameras to Canon, get them clean because we were in filthy, filthy places. 
uh, dump my, my memory, you know, into a desktop storage situation. And, um, but not long enough to get out of our, you know, you build up a certain kind of, uh, not regime, but you know, you're in a certain frame of mind, you know. You don't want to get too comfortable back in your old life. And um, the light, we didn't travel. All I had was a little tiny LED uh, camera light. I couldn't bring lights, just prohibitive. So I was constantly working with available light. My training as a still photographer, that's where it kicked in, because I know how to read light. I know how to use any kind of light to my advantage, and I had to for this trip. OK, so in the field, um, like I said, the pros and cons of a of a small crew. Um, I shot all the, the B-roll and the interviews. Pretty much my daughter um, did the interviews. So I took care of all that shooting, all the video shooting. My daughter pretty much started shooting most of the stills. And um, she was my sound person. You know, we rigged up uh, a shotgun mic. Um, we were redundant, just in case one was crappy. Shotgun mic on a small little stand that's made for like tabletop, you know, like putting little reflectors on tabletops. Real tiny um, uh, Matthews stand, I think it was. You know, it folded down to this minuscule size. So we had that, a little boom arm, put the shotgun on that, hardwired it into one uh, portal on the, uh, on the zoom, on the audio recorder and then use the lav and put that. So we had two. Now I could choose to use one or both and mix them. I didn't mix them on the spot. I did that later in post. Sometimes I just dropped one out, didn't need it. OK, um, when, I, when I was shooting B-roll, I was using uh, a little mixer, a juice link. A Beach Tech makes them as well. All right, so I, I would put the, the microphone on the camera, which I never did for an interview because it's not good sound, but I'd put that on the camera so I could run and gun. <coughs> it was fine for that. Um, and I'd run it through the juice link rather than into the camera with a mini plug, mostly because I use microphones that have XLR connections, so I need an interface. I never used headphones when I was doing my B-roll, um, mostly because I was you know, in the middle of street situations and I had to be safe. And the other thing is, I didn't want to stand out. Like I said, I don't want to look like a TV crew. So, you know, a lot of times you're winging it, but at least with the juice link and the beach tech, you can see meters. You can at least see if you're getting sound. It might be crappy sound, because <laughs> you only know that if you're wearing your headset, but at least you know if you're getting sound. OK, um, where are we? And we were in very challenging situations, extreme heat. Although, you know, they say these cameras, they don't do well in heat. Didn't have a problem. I was lucky, I guess. Um, and it wasn't like we could go in in air conditioning, because there was no air conditioning. In Thailand, we were sleeping on the floor of a bamboo hut. I mean, there was no water. There was no electricity. It was tough, you know. But um, for some reason, I was getting a phone on my BlackBerry, you know, or a signal on my BlackBerry. <laughs> I, sh I still want to write Verizon that. Maybe they'll throw some money at me, do a testimonial, I don't know. Um, but, but, you know, it was, because I was a traveler, um, my whole life, I was able to roll with the punches. I can be very flexible if I need to. I'm not a high maintenance kind of person. But I sure didn't have a computer tech on set. You know, I was everything, do it yourself. So the workflow, we'd get back um, wherever we were shooting. And we would download. And the first thing we would do is download all the material to two drives. We'd back it up. That was our first priority. Never looked at anything. Because we never knew if the electricity was going to go off, if we had it to begin with. So while we had it, that was our protocol. Download, charge everything, because it could go off in 10 minutes later. Um, we did redundant backups. And then if everything was going good, we got our job done, um, I would start sorting them. You know, I'd put the interview in one folder, I'd put the 
the B-roll in another folder, maybe just uh, audio excerpts, stills in another folder. I did a little housekeeping. If I had time, if I didn't just want to go to bed and if the lights were still on. All right. And like I said, I always kept my batteries charged. And we built in free time. Um, you know, not everywhere we went, we had a story. But we really needed that, that free time. But what did we do in our free time? Well, we'd probably go to a city like Moscow or Istanbul and shoot just stills. That was our free time. But it also acted like a buffer because there was a story we found out about along the way. And we had that time. We could build it in. So we were able to be flexible. Worst case scenario, we hung out a little longer in a nice place. Uh, there's a whole different sense of time when you leave the United States. You know, when we were in Africa, our subject kept saying to um, the people who worked for her, now, 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 now. I need it now, now. I'm like, why is she talking like that, you know? And that means, when, when we say, I need it now, well, that's what it means. But if you say, I need it now, that might mean tomorrow for them. But now, now means now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you can't, uh, you got to go with the flow, you know? What's the point? Because there's some situations you have no control over. <laughs> all right, so some regrets, all right? Um, Should have taken a better tripod. God, I can't curse that thing. Just curse that thing up and down. I won't even tell you what it is. A great tripod, but you know, it, for what it was, and it had to remember it had to fit in my suitcase. But you know, you're always giving something up, okay? Now, I always had it because it wasn't heavy. If it had been heavy, I probably would have talked myself out of it. Ah, I don't want to do that five mile hike with my tripod. I don't need it, you know? You've all been there, right? And I hate tripods. <laughs> um, it got the job done, but I think I probably would have brought something a little more substantial than that, because when you're trying to do pans, it just didn't cut it, you know? It wasn't smooth. OK, um, I wish I had brought a couple of things, if I had had the room. I wish I had brought one of those little indie sliders, those pocket dollies, you know? I think they're a little overdone now. But at the time, I wish I had it. It would have just brought a little more production values to some of the shots. Um, I wish I had, um, I say it when I wrote this, but now I'm rethinking it. You know, a focus knob? But that's not me. First of all, there's no one to do that focus knob. So, <laughs> you know, let me just focus it. And since I'm the age I was, you know, I grew up when, when I became a photographer when there was nothing uh, odd, automatic, no autofocus, no auto exposure, no nothing automatic. And that's how I shoot video. So the funny thing was, when I picked up the DSLR for the first time to shoot video, my instincts went back to me being a still photographer when I was first starting out. And there was a certain way I used to hold the camera, you know? And I had done it for so long. I mean, my, my, my left hand was my focus, my right hand was my shutter speed, you know? I just had it down. And I just went right into that. So it was good in that way. But what was bad was, you know, I was thinking in moments of time, just, just, oh, why didn't I let the camera run? This isn't a still photograph. Just, just, you know, it all came back to me. It was kind of funny. So it took a couple of days to sort of get that out of my head. I wish I had read the manuals. <laughs> <laughs> In particular, and I'll save you some strife, <laughs> if you have the H4N Zoom, the Samson audio recorder, um, that thing sucks batteries. They say you get, I don't know, eight hours? It's a big lie. It's more like two hours, you know? But, <laughs> or expect two hours. And I'll tell you why. Because if the battery dies, or if you just turn the thing off without stopping the recording first, and then turning it off, the file doesn't write properly. It gets corrupted, and it'll give you a heart attack. You know. Now, luckily, we retrieved the one corrupted file we had, but read the manuals. <laughs> because when I complained to the company, they said, well, did you read the manual? Yeah. I'm like, what could I say? Right. No, I didn't. I didn't read the manual. I did practice. 
But I didn't practice that. <laughs> um, OK. And like I said, I started thinking the other way. I started thinking like a still photographer, you know. I would be changing my exposure with my shutter speeds. You don't want to do that in video. Usually, you know, your rules are made to be broken, but the rule of thumb is your shutter speed should be twice your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 24 frames a second, which is what I was shooting, you want to get within uh, a 1 48th of a second on your shutter speed. So, you know, when you're in a hurry, you know, and you're ranking it up to 2 250th, it's fine. You got video, but it looks like the gladiator, you know, where the rain's like real sharp, little, <clears throat> everything's kind of jittery, like you've had too much coffee. OK, where are we? So when we returned, we kept blogging. We were building an audience. Um, I started, I was working on Final Cut 7 at the time, and I started transcoding. You don't have to do that with Premiere or Final Cut 10 now. But you know these files um, that come out of these cameras, they're so compressed that you can't really edit with them because they stutter and they stop and it drives you crazy. So you have to transcode them into a more substantial uncompressed file like an, like an Apple ProRes file. And so I did that. Um, and I did it for two reasons. I knew I wanted to get an editor because they can raise the bar on my craft. But I, I, wanted, to, um, I wanted to keep the cost down number one. And I wanted to familiarize myself with the footage. Because remember, I'm not looking at this stuff. And even though it's too late to go back and do it again, um, I, I need to know what I have to work with. Because when, when we're collaborating, you know, I can help solve a problem. Because I know my, my stuff, where to look for it. And it also makes me a better shooter. You know, because there's nothing like editing your stuff and saying, oh, I need something here, and you don't have it. And you know exactly what you should have gotten out in the field. So there's value that there in many, many ways. So I was doing the pre-edit for all those reasons. And I was looking for the right editor. You know, I couldn't afford a 40000 This was a $40,000 job. I couldn't afford a $40,000 editor. But I could afford a nice editor. <laughs> and that's what I wanted, someone who was really, really interested and passionate about what I was doing. And I was so fortunate to find the right editor. So I launched my first crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter. I um, asked for $7,500. That was my goal, because I could have made $7,499, I could have been a dollar off, and I'd get no money. Because that's how it works with Kickstarter. You either meet your goal, or you get nothing. So I was being conservative. I had already talked to the editor. The editor said he'd, he'd go for the $7,500 you know, if I did all the pre-edit. And I came in, well, it's 134% funded. So I came in just a little, a little over $10,000, and I um, pass that along to my editor, because that's why I raised the money. So I thought that was only fair. <coughs> so for the edit, um, they say a movie's written three times. The script, if you have a script. And then for documentaries, it's usually uh, your sound bites, the shoot, and the edit. And that's really where the story comes together. I mean, I could take that same 150 hours, and I could tell a totally different story. So that's truly where the story comes together. And you got to have that storyline in your head. It's like a mantra, you know, because you don't want to lose sight of it. Because if you do, and my problem was, like I said, I had 11 stories. How was I going to work that out? Luckily, I did read that book, Save the Cat. And, it, and it, ta it taught me story structure from a, from a screenwriter's point of view. And that was invaluable to me. So I knew I couldn't just do it linear and have people tick down through the continents. And that's when I, I used Maggie as the, as the anchor. And she was, she was such an engaging person on camera, young, enthusiastic, um, passionate about what she was doing, that um, it just worked so well. You know? But that didn't come to me until you know, till the edit process, quite frankly. It should have come to me before, but maybe next time it will. 
So I absolutely loved collaborating with my editor. I don't, you know, I tell people, my mother used to say, she used to be a realtor, and she used to say, don't buy the most expensive house on the block. You don't want to buy the most expensive house on the block. And I never really understood that too much, but um, I don't want to be the smartest person in the, in the room, <laughs> you know? I want to surround myself by people way smarter than me because it makes me look good. You know, I don't mind being in charge of all the smart people. <laughs> you know, that's ideal. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to be the smartest person because I know it's way better not to be. You know, that's ego. So, anyway. Um, but so the collaboration process was wonderful. And, um, and I think because I, I gave my editor um, not just respect, but a lot of latitude. I remember the first time I, I made a suggestion, him changing something, and it was the very first time, and, and we hadn't really gotten to know one another too well, and he kind of got very sort of uh, defensive. And he says, well, I'm gonna, this one I'm gonna push on. I'm like, well, okay, you can do it. You can, that's fine, all right, just a suggestion. And it really set the tone. He was right, but I was right about things down the line and he was willing to listen so it, it, you know you want a good relationship you don't want to be like this not with your editor that's that's not good um, while he was doing that I edited the trailer you know it was it was different than what you see now uh, what you saw now uh, it was a little longer but um, I spent my time doing that oh and by the way um, when you hand your footage off to an editor, they're probably going to want to see some sort of a written treatment so they know what the story is. As you remember, it's going to be all a bunch of hodgepodge of loose clips to them and sound bites. So rather than write something, what I did is I culled it down to a three hour timeline of sound bites in the order I thought the f story f should flow. So in a sense, it was, there was no B-roll, there was no pretty visuals on top of that. It was pretty much just my subjects telling the story in the order that I thought it should be. And it morphed from there, but that's what I delivered to them. And I kept blogging. So filmmaking is a two-part process. There's the creating of the film, which is the fun part, or should be. And there's connecting with your audience, and that really means marketing and promotion. And each part should have a 50-50 stake in the budget. Don't wait until the film's done, because then it's a shame. You got no film to push it out there, or no money to push it out there, and you really need that money. So, I mean, I, before I forget, I did another round of funding on Indiegogo, just for marketing and promotion. That wasn't as successful, but I was tapping the same people twice. So I think that's part of it. And I think the other part of it was that, you know, I kind of got in on Kickstarter when it was a year old. So it was still somewhat of a novelty. And now every, it seems like everybody's got a Kickstarter project and everybody's asking for money. So, you know, my timing was good on it. So anyway, festivals and screenings. Um, the first thing we did is we, we wanted to have a sneak preview before we put it out to festivals. So we did. We rented uh, Michael Moore's Theater, actually, in Traverse City, Michigan. I have family there. And it's this incredible, renovated, old-time movie house with state-of-the-art digital um, projection. And it was 250 bucks to rent. And I knew I could fill the theater because I had all my old aunts and uncles that were just dying to tell their friends and neighbors about this thing. And that was great because we got audience feedback. Um, have a strategy if you enter festivals. You can't go backwards. And what I mean by that is, let's say you, you're going to apply to the big ones, Sundance, Tribeca, South by Southwest, Toronto, most of them want your film to premiere there. Some, like Sundance, they want your film to premiere there, to be in the competition, OK? Now, let's say you got real excited and somebody said, oh, can we, how about you get your, how about you send us your film for the Sidewalk Blah 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 Festival in Long Beach Island or something like that? And you say, yeah, great, cool, guess what? 
you just screwed your chances for the big festivals. You can't go backwards. Strategize that. There's books written about this sort of thing, okay? Um, and, and, and by the way, notice I called it a sneak preview, not a premiere. Semantics. They were putting that on the marquee. You know, and they put their marquee with the old time letters. It was so cool. It was at night after, um, what's that movie called? Tom? Midnight. Midnight in Paris. I'm like, oh, and I love that movie. And they're like, oh, wow, look at this. And our names are going up. You know, it was like, so it was like being in a movie. And the guy starts putting up premiere. I'm like, no! <laughs> like someone was watching, you know? <laughs> All right, um, and without a box, withoutabox.com, that will be your friend. You put in all your information about your film and they'll ask a zillion things about the tech stats and everything, synopsis, this and that. You do it once, you pay your money through them, you can even put your screener online, okay? Or you can just do the transaction online and then deliver, you know, send the, the hard copy DVD to them. Oh. To the festivals, yeah, sorry. Um, don't wait till you get into a festival to prepare all the assets that you need to prepare. And they're going to want, and they give you no notice. The big ones, if you're so lucky to get into the big ones, they're, they, they're, some of them might even want a 35 millimeter print, God forbid. Be prepared to spend a lot of money. Um, but most of them want like HD cams or DigiBeta. That's changing. Everything's changing now. And um, many now will accept a Blu-ray or DVD or even a, an MOV file or an Apple TV file. They're all different. But don't wait to prepare that stuff because you will have no time. Uh, so be prepared. And the other thing is um, get help, you know. Put together an awful lot of collateral for this thing. Postcards to send out. Your one sheet or your movie poster, you know. They want those. They want um, press kits, you know. And a press kit could be a PDF or it could be a hard, um, you know, printed thing like this. And basically it gives the synopsis of the movie to text specs, the, the cast, the crew, you know, the who's, what's, where's, when's, or why. And all that takes time. Luckily, uh, this since I'd been blogging, um, by the way, all that blogging was building an audience. That was how I, I was able to be successful with crowdfunding. I had built an audience and didn't realize it. And they, they were on board. So the other people that came to me who were on board was this, this guy who, who does like all these book covers. You know, you go into a store, probably 70% of the book covers are him. He, he designed, he said, I want to do your poster for you. And I want to do your, do your packaging for you. And I'm like, OK, I, I can't, I can't, you know, I have no money. I can't pay. No, no, I, I wouldn't take your money. And he designed this beautiful, beautiful thing for me. Another woman came to me, and she was a singer-songwriter who had seen the blog. She lived in Vancouver, um, Canada. And she said, I can't believe it. I wrote this song. It's like I wrote it for your movie. Please, if you want to, use it. And she was absolutely right. So that, that's on the track, too. So networking is really important, you know, and, and having people read your copy, you know, because you might be close to it. You know, make sure it makes sense to somebody that doesn't know anything about your story so it makes sense before you shoot it out there. And now I'm monetizing it, OK? Um, you know, you can do that with a documentary easier than a narrative. A narrative is really meant for the four walls. They, they'll say, you know, outside the four walls. Four walls meaning a conventional theater. How about a, a, narrative? a narrative is fiction, a fiction piece as opposed to a documentary. Okay, so, um, like I said, I'm my my vision was to set up grassroots community screenings. You know, my my. The whole reason I became a photographer to begin with was because I wanted access to people and their cultures and to create awareness. So it was a mean, my camera was a means to an end. Quite frankly, when I became a photographer, it wasn't because I loved photography. I was like, OK, you know. <laughs> but that was not where my love was. My love was in connecting with people and their cultures and creating awareness. And so, so the film was kind of meant to do that from the start.
But I hired a consultant, and a couple of consultants, and, and they said, yes, that's where the strength is. And because it's episodic, I could even take this forward and take all those folders full of other people and do more episodes. I could pitch it to broadcast. I could pitch it to, to cable. I could even pitch it to online, Hulu or Yahoo or Netflix. They're doing shows now. I think that's the next wave, quite frankly, and go direct to sponsor. I could go direct to, let's say, you know, Tom Shoes, for instance. They're, 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 it's a very small company, socially responsible company. For every pair of shoes they send, they sell, they give a pair to <coughs> people who have no shoes. So think of those connections. That's where the new opportunities are. New opportunities aren't you know, trying to get a job out in Hollywood, believe me, because you know, they're all freaked out, too. <laughs> <laughs> I go to NEB every year, you know, and, and I don't go look at all the cool stuff on the floor. I go sit there and I listen to all the movers and the shakers on the panels because I want to know what they're talking about because I figure that's going to affect me five years from now. So that's what I do. I, I don't care about all this stuff, you know, unless I'm looking for something, I need something. That's a different thing. Okay, so we, we, we are expanding the website beyond the film because the film is a dead end. You know, I see it. I see people, they get really inspired. They're sitting there in the theater. They want to do something. And then they're going to walk out, and a week later, boom, they're back to what, whatever they were thinking before. So we were, we're moving it into more take action, you know, where um, we, we can connect communities with volunteers who need uh, or um, organizations that need volunteers with people who want to volunteer, that sort of thing. I'm monetizing the other assets. You know, when you do this, this um, crowdfunding, you know, you got to give, you don't have to, but everybody does give these perks. You know, if, if, you, if you donate $25, you get a DVD. If you donate 50, you might get a book or whatever it is you want to do. My, I, I had fun with it, and since it was kind of like being nice to the planet, you know, I did like stainless water bottles with lo movie logos on it, you know, to, to put the branding out there. So I had all that stuff. I can monetize that, you know, because it's already made. The work's done. I could, do, I could bring it to film festivals if I wanted to. And re-edits. Started out as 76 minutes. This version's 61. I'd like to actually do an edit with just Maggie, but if I'm still interested. So distribution. Um, you can self-distribute. You know, Amazon, you could sell hard DVDs. iTunes, you know, if you figure out their, you know, cryptic system and are so lucky to get in there for, for uh, VODs, video on demand. Same with Netflix. People can rent your movie. Uh, Hulu. These are all things you can put into play yourself. But you got to promote it. You got to do the marketing. They don't. Nice being on iTunes. If somebody finds you, it's like having something on YouTube. What good is it with the jillions that are out there? You got to tell people where it is. I uh, say conventional distribution. You know, you can get a sales agent or a producer's rep. A producer's rep is someone who would rep me and all my properties. A sales agent's going to rep just one product. They're going to go to distribution. So that's going to be two cuts out of your money. Or you can go direct to distribution, but a lot of those people don't even want to talk to you unless you're somebody. It's like a chicken and an egg scenario. Or you can do a little of both, which is what I'm doing. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I, there are two distributors that you know, said they wanted to sign me on. But I looked at the contract, and I'm like, who's doing who the favor here? You got to be out of your mind. You know, they're not even as bad. Th these were worse than magazine contracts. <laughs> you know how those have been these days. All right, so, so think beyond the box office, and you can do that with the documentary. Give it legs. You know, don't do all that work for nothing. And there are new opportunities out there, um, certainly in the nonprofit sector. Video is, um, is a very effective way for raising money, and they know it. Uh, it's, it's an emotional medium. 
because you got the music, you've got sound, you know, you've got all those things that pull at people's heartstrings, and they find it's very effective. All right. Here's some resources. Um, some you probably already know about Mailchimp. You know, that's just a database to send the emailers out. Google Analytics. Of course, you want to see where you're doing well. By the way, when I when I first put the trailer online, within I think less than six weeks, it had been seen in 125 countries. Think of that that power we have today. You know, there's only 193 countries in the whole world. And I'm just a person in New Jersey, and people in 125 countries have seen that? That just staggers my mind. Festival Genius, if you do get in a festival, and the festival hooks you up with them, that's, that's really just a, a nice little tool for marketing buzz. You know, they, they make it easy. John Rice, um, check out his blog, johnrice.com. He's great at... Um, thinking outside the box. And Film Specific, filmspecific.com, that's another great. So um, there's my, actually two websites and my email address. If anybody has any questions, how are we doing on time? It's two oh, good, good, we got lots of questions. Time for questions. You brought up something about the, uh, this is your relationship with the editor. Uh -huh. now, uh -huh. Your approach to tell, writing the story and giving it to him to tell the story, I was always under the impression that the writer slash author would be hanging over the editor's shoulder saying, cut here, cut there. S some do. Sure. Some, some, some relationships are like that, yeah. But I would, I would prefer to, um, like I said, I don't want to be the smartest one. So if I'm going to hire someone, I'm going to hire them and trust that they're going to do something and bring this project where I can't bring it. Now, I might think I have all the answers. And there are times when I'm going to say no. And I'll tell you one time. Um, Maggie, she's got all these kids, right? She, she was talking about the children um, on a, and using names, saying, Nisha came to us and she had been in an abusive household and they sold her as an indentured servant and but she wasn't comfortable showing the child while their story was being told and I don't blame her okay so we had this argument about that and he says no you have to do it and I said no he says you're being overly sensitive you can't let your subjects control your story and I said no I I'm sorry I'm, I, I, I overrule that, <laughs> you know? And you have to be a strong director, too, by the way. You, gotta let, you have to let people know who's boss, you know, and that you need to be decisive. And I said, look, I've got this kind of really edgy, and it didn't have great production values. It was shot with a little GoPro. I put a GoPro on Maggie's helmet one day, and I just told her to scoot around through town, right? And a scooter, and so all the bumps, this is like, you know, and it felt really kind of like disturbing. I said, you use that because these were all disturbing stories, talking about kids growing up eating mud, not him. I mean, just really, really hard to hear stories. So rather than see that child who looks like a normal child now because they've been living with Maggie and they're well fed and they're educated, um, I, want, I want the viewer to feel uneasy and we're going to go with that footage instead. And we argued about it. And at the end of the day, you know, I made the call. And now he thinks it's the right call. But I think because he's gotten used to it. Yeah. There was a. Right? Um, along the same lines, you said you did a pre edit before giving it to the editor. Mm -hmm. Was that for the purposes of kind of doing a broad stroke of what you wanted? Yeah. That, to, to see what I had. Um, <laughs> to take out anything that was really embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you know when you're, you're, you're thinking you're shooting and you're not? And you're not shooting when you think you are? You know what I mean? Th that kind of stuff, you know? I got some nice ground footage, you know? And I, yeah, you know? <laughs> Remember, I wanted him to respect me as a director, right? So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> that was one reason. Um, get familiar with my footage was another reason. 
Um, and to, to flesh out in my head the stories. You know, and by the way, you know, I, I did not write a script, okay, because it's a documentary, all right? But I did have those transcripts from my interviews. Essentially, that was my script. So I would use my paper transcripts, but I would always, you know, paper's great, and it sounds, wow, now that's a great sound bite. But then when you see the real thing, they're delivering it like, um, and but, and uh, 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 you know. Well, that sucks, right? So, you know, you got to do both. And then when I, when I pulled out the gems out of 150 hours, <coughs> and I got those down to three hours, that was kind of the very roughest, roughest draft I could give him. And then we talked. Because he was independently working on the, the, the small stories within and then how to tie them together. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. As a documentary, the structure of your story is revolved around the interviews. How structured were you in your interviews? Did you sort of uh, tailor those? Yeah, oh yeah, I, I had all my questions, but you know, a good interviewer is a good listener, because some of the best questions are the ones you didn't think to ask, but it's triggered by something your subject says, and if you're not listening, if you're just like, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to ask, then you're going to miss that, so yeah. And then some people, like the, the Polish lady, she, um, she had a very difficult story to tell, it was about her daughter dying. And um, it took us three days before she could tell it. So yeah, everybody's different. Yeah. Well, I just since you're not writing a script or anything. Yeah. So how did you lay out the sequence of events that you're shooting? Meaning, you meaning what I was going to shoot? Yes. Oh, I was just totally winging that. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, you had something <laughs> I mean, like, Ma for instance, one day. Uh, Maggie had a problem with um, it had rained the night before. And this is Nepal and they have like open sewer trenches, you know, and going down. There. And all the disgusting whatever came like boom right in front of her driveway because they hadn't closed the sewer there. They had stopped. They had run out of money. So they had stopped like right there. And so there it was all right there. And all the kids from her home had to cross this disgusting stuff to get to school. And so she said, Gail, let's go to the um, town clerk, and I want you to videotape this. I'm like, OK, <laughs> you know? So I like, I'm like, OK. I get in my Michael Moore head, you know? And I go and like with the camera rolling, you know? <laughs> and, and so it ran from that to, you know, I, I, I didn't want to. Um, orchestrate it, you know what I mean? I had to be ready. I had to anticipate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but at least the sequence that, you know. I never knew. Oh, okay. I really, I never yeah, knew. There's an interview. It's like, come on, we're going on the boat, let's go, you know? I didn't, I didn't, I, like, like I said, I like to work, I'm a fly on the wall, all right? If I wanted to have it scripted and predictable, I'd do a narrative. Mm -hmm. I'd do a fiction piece, and maybe I will. But this, I was just, Truly playing it by the seat of my pants. But you know, I, I've been doing it forever since a photographer, so I'm, you know, I, I, I'm a street shooter by nature, you know. For more information, please visit us online, give us a call, or stop by our New York City Superstore. You can also connect with us on the web.